Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And today our special guest is Dr. Bill Schindler, and he'll be speaking at our conference in February. Bill is also our keynote speaker because of his topic, Where is Nutrition Headed? Ancestral Diets, Food Processing, and the Domesticated Ape. So how's it going today, Bill? Oh, it's going great. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, I know it's a busy time of year for you, for all of us. Uh, let me describe a little bit more about Bill. Bill is an internationally known modern anthropologist specializing in primitive technology, experimental archaeology, and also a chef. He's received his master's and PhD degrees from Temple University in Philadelphia, which we just realized that uh, Bill didn't know it was my alma mater. Bill is also an author of Eat Like a Human. He founded and directs the Eastern Shore Food Lab with a mission to preserve and revive ancestral dietary approaches to create a nourishing, ethical, and sustainable food system. Along with his wife, they operate the modern Stone Age kitchen in Maryland. He was the focus of Wired Magazine's YouTube series, Basic Instinct and Food Science, and he co-starred in the National Geographic Channel series, The Great Human Race. So, Bill, we'd like to get a little bit more uh, background. Tell us about professional and personal interests. And it turns out we have a lot in common uh, mm -hmm. since we both grew up on the uh, East Coast, me from Philadelphia and you from New Jersey. Actually, it's the same part of the world. Well, thank you for that introduction. So my interest, I've always had a deep interest in food and diet and health. Uh, and it started because I had an incredibly unhealthy relationship with food my entire life. I, I was an overweight kid, um, who, and I viewed food as a, as a kid as something that I knew I needed, that I craved all the time. But, uh, you know, I, I viewed it as something that, that made me uglier, made me heavy, and, and made other kids pick on me. And then, you know, I went through a series of different stages uh, to get to where I am now, uh, uh, and one of them was I was an athlete in the middle of all this. And, and what was crazy is that I went from this, this heavy kid with this craving for food and, 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 and all the other issues that come along with that to an in shape athlete, which still had an unhealthy relationship with food. I mean, I was, I was a, a wrestler uh, in high school. I was a wrestler for Ohio state and the college of New Jersey, both incredible programs. And um, I went from, you know, being scared of, or, 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 you know, hating food to being scared of food because I would miss weight. I was cutting a uh, minimum 22 pounds in a day and a half every single week to make weight in college. And then, you know, it really became a huge issue when I uh, finished, uh, because I, I wasn't an athlete any longer and I still had this terrible diet and all the weight poured back on and all the other metabolic disease poured back on. And my life as far as health was concerned, was literally in the toilet. Um, I, I couldn't sleep at night. I had restless legs sort of things going on. My, my digestive tract was a mess and I was just heavy and I, I was sick all the time. And throughout this entire process, I had nutritionists. I had people telling me what I should be eating. I mean, we had doctors at Ohio State telling us what we should be eating. And none of it made sense. I tried all the different you know fad diets and, and what really made sense and what brought it all together for me and my life and my health, and then we've been able to implement that with our family and now really with the community through the endeavors that my wife and I and my whole family have here is when I, when I blended together my training in archaeology and anthropology, my training as a chef, and just my understanding of, of, of really what it means to be human, I really you know, came up with an, with an outlook about food that I think is, is really unique, but also is incredibly powerful. And in no time transform, I'm, I'm going to be 50 years old next month, and I am in better shape now than at any moment when I was a division one athlete in college. I, uh, and it's just my, my relationship with food has never been better. My relationship with myself has never been better. And we have been able to implement all these different things in ways that are really powerful for the whole family. But one other quick caveat with that is, so this, my, uh, you know, I, my PhD is in archaeology and anthropology. I've been studying ancestral diets for a very long time, but what really helped bring it home was, and, and make it relevant, was my family and I have had a, a very um, unique opportunity to travel the world and live and work with indigenous people all over, you know, all, all over the place from, from Asia to South America to to, to Europe, to Africa, all over. And we have hunted with groups, we've gathered with groups, we've cooked with groups, we've shared with groups, and 
And, and what that has allowed us to do was take this really scattered, um, incomplete archaeological record and our interpretations of that and bridge that gap between what we find in the ground and what it really might have been like and how it becomes how it can become relevant today. So we found it, you know, once once uh, we started to piece those things together, again, transform my health, my family's health. Um, we I wrote the book Eat Like a Human. And then we opened up this restaurant called the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, which we actually took that book as a template and all the recipes in it and all the approaches and are making that food, uh, you know, for the community there as well. And as you mentioned, we also have a nonprofit called the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which is where all of our uh, continuing research, our outreach, and our education uh, goes through. Yes, well, thanks for giving us some of the detail there, Bill. Um, when you traveled with the family, was was that part of your PhD work? Was that just something wonderful that you felt your family needed to do? How did that come to be? <laughs> it's a, a combination of several different things. Uh, it started really... Um, when well, there's several different things that started it off, but it really became important to me when I filmed the uh, the series of the Great Human Race for National Geographic, and uh, I'll, I'll say a few things about that that series. If, if anybody's never, if you've never seen it and you're interested in ancestral diets and our evolutionary past, I'm t it was a brilliant show, and and I, I love the concept. And what happened was about seven years ago, National Geographic contacted me, and they wanted to capitalize on this this genre the survival tv genre it was re i mean it's still kind of big but in, seven years ago it was a huge deal everybody was packing their bug out bags and you know they, they and all these different television networks were were vying for um trying to, they were all trying to figure out the next big survival tv show and it was getting really really silly i mean they naked and afraid had just come out and, th and then they were taking people and, and they were handcuffing them together and putting them in the woods and trying to get them to survive and doing all these crazy, silly things. Um, there was a show called Dude, You're Screwed, where, you know, a bunch of guys would get around and supposedly they were all buddies, but they'd like stick somebody in the terrible. All these silly things were happening. But National Geographic said, hey, listen, let's take this 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 push for this. The, the, you know, people are all excited about it and tell a real story. You know, use it as an opportunity to tell the story about our shared ancestral past. I mean, the, the thing that binds all of humanity together and do it in a really smart, entertaining way. So they um, they landed on me and my co-star, Kat Bigney, who's a survival um, expert from, from out West, from high desert survival expert. And they put us, it was 10, ser uh, 10 episode series, and they put us in 10 different places around the world. And instead of being all silly and handcuffs and all this other stuff, what they said was, let's do this. We'll pick the so 10 of the most important milestones in our evolutionary past. Um, we understand the role of uh, technological innovation and how we were over, able to overcome things in, in the past. And we'll stick you in, in, in these different places. And my expertise is in those, those ancient technologies. I, my job was to replicate the technologies from this particular time period. And Kat and I were supposed to live for a period of about 10 days at a time in each of these locations where it would have taken place in the past using only those tools. Now, there's some limitations, right? One limitation is the environment in, say, Tanzania right now is not the same as it was two and a half million years ago, but it was the closest the television has come to being able to tell the story, and it was great. And, you know, for me, I loved being able to apply all the things that I've been teaching for decades, um, you know, test all these tools out, test myself out. Um, but what was really fascinating, there were two things that were really big takeaways for me. One was in each location we went. We started in Tanzania, we went through Africa, through the Middle East, through Asia, and ended up in Oregon at 4,000 years. We started two and a half million years ago, ended up 4,000 years ago in Oregon. Um, in each location, we had about a week with an indigenous or traditional group from that area that we just live with and learn from. They taught us how to stay away from these snakes, which plants are edible and all those sorts of things, which, you know, mind blowing. And I really, at that moment, saw the value of this traditional knowledge and, 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 how, and how deep and vast it was. Second, about halfway through filming, um, we were in, we, <laughs> we had just literally, and it, it finished the, the worst night of the entire experience. And we, and we were sleeping in trees. We were sleeping in caves. This night we were in Turkey and we were sleeping in a swamp. And it was hot. It was miserable. We're covered in sweat, you know. And I remember looking out and we had, we had a fire going. And, and the only reason we had a fire going was to try to keep some of the bugs away. It was so hot. We still had a fire. And we saw all these sparkles. 
It looked like millions of jewels all over the ground around us. And I'm thinking, this is the only nice thing about this night is how beautiful all these little sparkly, jewelly looking things were that surrounded us. And then I realized they were spider eyes. So it was a horrible night. I got absolutely no sleep. But the next morning, the head camera guy, Luke Cormack, he's an amazing, um, he, he, he's an uh, amazing camera guy. And he says to me, listen, I got to tell you something. You know, I, this, he had the unfortunate job of staring through a camera lens at me 24 hours, almost 24 hours a day, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and months on end. And that was his job. I mean, he, he watched my face all the time. He says, I got to tell you, you know, we, every episode we start, you know, you're healthy. You have, you have, you have, you have a pretty healthy diet. You know, and, and he said, I'm looking at your eyes. I'm looking at your face. And he said, several days into each episode, everything changes. Your eyes brighten, your skin clears, your smile changes. And two things are really interesting about that. One is I had just spent one of the worst nights of my life, you know, the night before. But the way we filmed was we would go to a certain location. We would uh, stay with a particular group for about, a, about a, a week or so to learn. Then we would start filming and we filmed for 10 days. And what you saw on TV is what you got. I mean, it was, it was real. We're living in caves, we're eating what we gather and hunt and all this. And then at the end of that 10 days, they put us in this like five-star resort for a night or two, and then we go to the next location. So there's there's this reset button over and over again where we kind of come back to the modern world and kind of a modern diet. And then we have this you know period of time eating this ancestral diet. And it's not even that long, but it, it, it's days. And this man noticed how I changed in just a few days eating a diet that was you know, real, <laughs> eating a diet that was nourishing. He saw it in my eyes, he saw it in my skin, he saw it in my smile. So anyhow, to make a long story short, when we got done filming, I'm like, this is important. Like, I need to learn more and I need to share this with the people I love the most, my family. And we were able to find a lot of different ways to travel and spend time. And part of it was, you know, when I was on sabbatical, writing the book, Eat Like a Human, but we just made it a priority for our family to make this, make this happen. And it was been amazing. That's great, Bill. Well, well, I guess on camera back then you were actually living like a human, uh, <laughs> and in between, and a pre-human, absolutely, yes, yeah, like a like a pre-human. But what I'd like to do is is dive in a little bit and talk about you know what it is to eat like a human, what 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 that really means, and you know from from your background now now it's an interesting thing. Some people joke that anthropology and archaeology and ethnology aren't really sciences because, you know, you just kind of look back in history and, and you, and you kind of guess. And it's an interesting thing when we get these, uh, these talks approved for, edu for educational credit for healthcare professionals. A lot of times we get uh, into trouble with the, um, with the ancestral talks because yeah. they say it has no relevance. And you know my my head wants to explode, so you know hopefully you're gonna you're gonna um, at least uh, educate the uh, review committee that there, there there is relevance. And so you know I want to pose the question, you know what is the what is the evidence that you have uh, through your career? And I'm just joking about that it's not a real science. It obviously is. And you know what is um, uh, an ancestral diet? And you know how what is unique about what you do and how that applies to uh, our, our diets in Western society today? Well, those are, those are huge questions. Okay. So the first thing is you're hundred percent right. It, it, it is a science, but it's not a hard science. It's not like biology or chemistry or physics. It is a, uh, a science that is wide open to interpretation. And I can understand why somebody might look at it and, and, and question some of, some of its validity. And, and it should be. One thing we need to recognize is that every, well, all information, you know, period. Any, any human giving some other human information is always biased, period. It's always biased. And especially in anthropology and archeology, span it really, really is. And one thing that's interesting is from the moment you find something in the ground, all the way through the steps to identify the artifact, um, you know, understand how it was used, understand what how those artifacts, you know, fit into a larger cultural system, whether it was hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years ago. Every one of those steps is an interpretation, and because it is an interpretation, it and and some are certainly way more valid than others. 
everything about the anthropologist or the archaeologist um, plays a role in you know, how those interpretations are made, how valid they are, and how they're communicated to the outside world. And one of the things that we're finding now is that um, the environment, the context in which archaeologists are working, plays a very large role in, 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 in how archaeological sites are interpreted. A lot of archaeology was done. I mean, anybody who watches Indiana Jones knows, you know, the archaeology, you know, one of its heydays was in the mid 20th century, you know, right around World War II. There's a lot of archaeology being done right beforehand, right afterwards for a lot of different reasons. And a lot of things that are happening during uh, the war uh, impacted how archaeologists felt, saw what was coming out of the ground. And I, I don't want to spoil it all right now. We're going to talk about a lot of these things at the conference. But one of the things uh, about the war effort is that everybody back at home, you know, well, well, you know, our, our soldiers were off fighting. We're trying to do something to feel relevant, trying to feel like we were making a difference and somehow things like victory gardens and, you know, plants and, 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 and giving up days of the week when we're eating meat. So it became very important to focus on plant heavy diets. Plants were going to help you know, it's when the war at some level, and this was ingrained in a lot of people's minds. And the way that we interpreted archaeological sites with that sort of thing in the back of our mind, I am confident played a role in um, interpreting how important plants were versus animal-based foods in the archaeological record. Now there are archaeologists going back and looking at the very same sites, the very same artifacts, the very same data, and reinterpreting these sites through different eyes and coming up with different conclusions. People like Miki Vendor, for example, who, who was fabulous looking at the importance of meat and fat in, in, in our ancestral dietary past. So the reason I bring all that up is yes, it is wide open to interpretation. The best thing that we can do is to understand where the archeologist is coming from or archeologists when they're interpreting these sites, who they are, what they stand for. Um, but there is some information that we, you know, th even though archaeology isn't a hard science, there's a lot of hard science that goes into understanding the archaeological record. So if, like dating methods, for example, or blood residue analysis and all of these things that can tell us a lot about a site um, is, or is, you know, ha has, a, has an approach that, that's very, very hard and, and, and scientific. What we know is, is this. Our ancestors, and I'll give you a quick version here, but I'm going to dive deep in, in, at the conference, and, I, and I'm hoping, you know, let me back up one more thing that I think is very important. I um, almost left college to go to culinary school. Um, long story, it took me 10 years to get my undergraduate, but um, I almost left to go to culinary school. I knew food was a passion of mine, and I knew I wanted to do something in the food world. And I'm glad I didn't, because if I had left college and going into culinary school at that time, I wouldn't be able to approach food uh, the, through the eye, you know, through the lens that, that I have now, which is, I think, a very, very, very um, unique lens. I also am thankful at some level for all of the difficulties that I had with my own health and my own relationship with food, because at the same, for the same reasons, I'm looking at food through a completely different, different lens as well. And I'm also very happy that. My focus in archaeology is in that primitive technology sphere. You know, I, I've spent decades of my life training with some of the best stone tool makers, you know, ancient pottery, people that replicate ancient pottery, um, working with, with fibers and all of these things, because what I've been able to determine is that almost every single prehistoric technology, I mean, for 3.3 million years, three, almost three and a half million years ago is when our first stone tool was created our first technological development that we know of at the moment. For almost three and a half million years, almost every single prehistoric technology ever created has something to do with food, period. It's something to do with food, getting food, processing food, making it safe, making it more nutrient dense, making it more bioavailable, uh, sharing food, redistributing food, storing food. I mean, think about that. We know that the um, our changing diets impacted and helped support our evolutionary changes in our bodies and in our brains, right? We, we, we know that's true. And if the role of technology is so directly linked with our dietary change, then we can't escape the need to understand what those technological developments were to understand a dietary past and also to understand where, where my focus is, how we still need to implement 
those are similar technologies in our in, in our modern diets today. And that's where archaeology becomes incredibly relevant. We 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 find the tools, we you know, we found the sites, we find the tools, we can date the sites, we can interpret those sites, and we can really start to understand how the, the role of technology uh, impacts diet and then how it impact diet's evolutionary change. So it's always been the technology of food. Uh, so perhaps we've uh, gotten better at food technology. Why, why <laughs> oh, is this <laughs> argument that uh, you know technology has actually gone in the wrong direction? I, I was teaching a class. Uh, so one semester, about seven or eight years ago, I was teaching... Um, Oh, I usually taught three classes a semester at Washington College. And this one semester, I was teaching a class that had something, I forget the exact class that it was, but it had something to do with, with, with uh, it was a kind of the anthropology of food. And it was talking about food in a modern sense. And the same, you know, the same semester I was teaching another class it was a prehistoric class. And, and, and one of my students was in both those classes at the same time. And about midway through the semester, she came up to me. She said, Dr. Schindler, Dr. Schindler, I didn't want to ask this class in, or ask this question in, in class in front of the other students because it might be a silly question, but I just don't understand it. I said, what? She said, you say the word food processing in both classes. And when you say it in the prehistoric class, it's like you're excited, you're animated, you're dancing around, you're smiling ear to ear. When you say food processing in the modern you know, class, it looks like somebody ran over your dog. Like you're super upset and, and, and it's such a bad thing. What's the difference? And I looked at her and I said, I know there's a difference, but I don't know. Let me think about it. And I thought about it for quite some time. It was a, it was a great question. I'm so glad I had that student in both classes to kind of challenge me on it. And what I've landed on is this. And this is so crucial to just about everything that I do now. And I think uh, so important for us to keep in mind as we sort of uh, picture what our ancestral dietary past was really like. Almost all of our prehistoric technology said it's something to do with food, made food safe, more nutrient dense, and more bioavailable. Either one of those things, or in many cases, all of them at the same time. So that's that's that. That's what food processing for almost the entirety of 3.3 million years was all about. On the other hand, modern food processing is focused, you know, has another goal. Modern food processing is really about a, a very few people making a whole lot of money, right? So it's about things like um, uh, shelf life and uh, the ability to ship long distances without things getting bruised or uniformity or the way that it looks on a shelf. You know, that's that's what modern food processing is about. And unfortunately, not only is it about that, but it's often at the expense of one of those three major things that ancestral food processing was was really focused on. I mean, think about this. And this is a, a very quick story, but I think it's a really relevant story. Um, right before National Geographic asked me to to be on their uh, on that show, uh, that show Naked and Afraid had come out, and there were the student. I was teaching a prehistoric technology class at the time, and and a bunch of my students in the class were like, "Hey, you're perfect for Naked and Afraid. You need to be on Naked and Afraid." And I didn't really want to be on Naked and Afraid for 15 different reasons. So I, I, I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm, I can't tell the students I don't want to be on Naked and Afraid because they're going to, they're going to, you know, make fun of me. So I'm going to ask my wife if I can be on Naked and Afraid. And I know she's going to say no. Then I can go back and say, hey, guys, I'd love to be on it. But my wife said no. So I sat my wife. I remember vividly how this went down. I brought my wife upstairs and I, I said, can you sit down? I got a question for you. She said, yeah. I said, you know that show Naked and Afraid? which we had watched the family a couple of times. She said, oh yeah, I know that show. I said, the students want me to be on it. What do you think? And she thought about it for a minute, a little bit longer than I wish she had thought about it. And then she said, you know, that'd be okay. I said, that'd be okay? What do you mean that'd be okay? You've seen the show. They take a guy and a girl, they strip them down naked and they put them in the woods in the middle of nowhere and they survive for 28 days or whatever it is together. You're okay with that? She said, yeah, I think so. And I said, why? She said, listen, I've seen the show. Even if somebody comes in and it's usually the guy with a little bit of amorous thoughts, after a day or two of not eating, getting covered in bugs and poison ivy and sunburn and diarrhea and all the rest of it, the last thing on their mind is any, any hanky-panky. So it might be the safest place you could be. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. I got it. Now, I still had another problem to deal with the students, but that was really relevant in my mind because think about this. You know, all life on this earth is trying to do the same thing, reproduce viable offspring. And 
if they do it, they survive. And if something goes wrong, then they become extinct. 99% of all species that ever lived on this planet have become extinct. A lot of species have, have, have gotten it wrong at some level, at some point in, in prehistory. Not only did our ancestors continue to survive, they were doing so well. They were, they were creating technologies that allowed them to extract increasingly diverse and nutrient-dense resources from their environment, and most importantly, create technologies that made that food safe, nutrient-dense, and bioavailable as possible. That not only did, did the species survive through time, but it supported massive body and brain growth. Massive body and brain growth. Our brains are... are 2% of our bodies, but require 20% of the nutrition that we take in solely to fuel, just our brains. So the nutritional needs were skyrocketing as our bodies and our brains were growing and our ancestors were creating the technologies that, nutri that nutritionally supported that massive growth. I mean, th they weren't sur sur surviving. They weren't subsisting. They were literally crushing it. That's how important those technological innovations were. Well, I, I hope you're not saying at the, the end of the, the show naked and afraid if they, they survive, they, they go ahead and uh, reproduce. But no, that, 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 Have you ever seen it? Yes. <laughs> it's great. I, I never really got it, but it was, it, it, I mean, it's, it's just about survival. But you also bring up the point that, but their food wasn't always ab abundant and plentiful. And so, you know, as you say, our, our uh, you, you know, we survived as humans and, you know, it's all open to an interpretation and was, was food plentiful. And, you know, if, if in, in modern society, if, if we're uh, given food, you know, are we just going to keep eating and eating? It, 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 the food industry obviously is very good at, um, you know, creating foods that drive our appetite, sure. but uh, also on the other side of it, we have people that say, well, we just eat like animals and, you know, food isn't necessarily plentiful because you have to, you have to hunt and you have to gather and, and, and the food isn't always available. And so you go for periods of time where, where there's, isn't food. So my question is, you know, what is it about the ancestral diet that, uh, that, that we want to look at and how do we define that? So there's a lot of things we can look at that are incredibly important. And uh, what I focus on and what I'm going to spend time talking about at the conference, and uh, I hope there's a ton of questions that we can have a great discussion about, is that role of technology uh, is so important. So here's here's what's interesting. And you mentioned eating like eating like animals. The things that we focus on today that mo the questions that most humans are trying to get an answer to um, that they think they need the answer to is what they should eat. I mean, really, I mean, that, that's really what it is. People go to these conferences to figure out what they should eat. They listen to podcasts, they hire dietitians, they go on a diet plan, whatever it is. And they want that answer. Okay. Wh what do I eat? Just tell me what to eat. And then I'll be healthy. It's not that simple. And in fact, that's interesting because that's the, that's the question that, other animals don't even need to ask. Like they, they innately understand what they have, what they should be eating. Their senses are so fine. I mean, through through evolutionary forces for millions of years, the you know, species on this planet understand what what they should put in their bodies and what they shouldn't. The the two groups of animals that uh, we've really screwed it up with are ourselves and our pets. Right, we've taken our pets out of out of a wild environment. We've domesticated them. We're feeding them very modern human-like diets, and they're coming up with, you know, diabetes and cancer and all the other modern issues that that humans are too. But let's put them aside for a second and talk about humans. Humans shouldn't have to ask the question what we should eat, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into this again at the conference. But um, that is a question that we ask that we, we need to put aside for a second. The important question, the thing about the uh, human relationship with food that's different than any other animal on the planet is the what part. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, the how part, how we should be eating. And that's the role of technology. So think about this. We started creating technologies three and a half, almost three and a half million years ago. And when we create these technologies, these technologies allow us 
to overcome our own physical limitations and extract food from the environment that we otherwise wouldn't be able to get. And most importantly, transform that food into its safest and most nourishing form possible for our bodies. We do that through technology. Our digest, you know, when, when our nutritional needs skyrocketed, you would expect that our teeth would get bigger, our jaw muscles would get bigger, our guts would get bigger to accommodate all the you know, massive amount of food we should be eating and, and processing that food properly to get all that nutrition that we need now that we have bigger bodies and bigger brains. But in fact, what happens is the exact opposite. Our bodies and our brains grow, our nutritional needs skyrocket, and our teeth get smaller and our digestive tracts get smaller. It shouldn't have happened that way, but it did. And that really helps support the idea that our technologies were doing this food for us. So if we look at it through another lens, we build bodies on food that we were never adapted to eat. The adaptation is a cultural one. The adaptation is a technological one. We created technologies that allowed us to bring these foods into our, into our diets and we require those technologies to process them as safely and as efficiently as possible. And, and we've domesticated ourselves to the point that we can no longer feed ourselves without those technologies. Like, I don't care if you're Bear Grylls, your best survivalist in the world, and you know every plant, every animal behavior pattern, what's edible, what's not edible, all of it, and threw you in the middle of the woods with no technologies, you would starve to death. You cannot support your body without the role of technology. Now, technology has changed. I mean, it was things like stone tools and fire, and now it's things like Vitamixes and, and, you know, and, and microwaves. But the, the, the role, the importance of that technology hasn't left. So we can't, as modern humans, ask the question what we should eat without also asking the question how we should be eating. Because the reality is most foods that are in our diets are, and, and I know this is really hard to, to say and define, but are not species appropriate because we're not designed to consume it, but our species requires the nutrition from those foods because we've had them in our diets forever, but we've had them alongside with the technologies needed to consume them in the most nourishing way possible. So the, the experience for humans, eat the, the dietary experience for humans is completely different than any other animal on the planet. And then you start throwing in all the cultural things. You know, e eating is such a cultural act. It's an emotional act. It's a political act. It's a religious act. You start throwing all of those things and, and trying to figure out what true, real nourishment means becomes very complicated. Yeah. So, I mean, I think fire is the, is the best example of an, an ancestral development over time that, uh, you know, that's the argument that uh, we, we cook the food and uh, we basically uh, take apart the proteins and that's what caused our brain to grow. And so that's, that's a very positive ancestral adaptation, but I guess that the tech has, has gone on and on over the years. Now we've, you know, we've created ultra processed foods that mm -hmm. are, are just so easy for our body to absorb. And we've made them, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, irresistible and the industry knows this, that, uh, you know, we, we've gotten into trouble. And one other thing that, you know, I've, learned or, or i you know i understand it from from the ancestral pro approaches that you know we're we're omnivores we're opportunistic and we we eat what's available to us and so you know it's interesting we we have people uh arguing that we should just eat meat you know and 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 for that matter we should eat raw meat but i think you've already explained that the you know some raw meat is okay but we're not adapted uh, to eat raw meat, we don't have huge canines. And so we've adapted to eating m meat that has been cooked. And so, you know, what, what, what is your uh, position on, on the meat eaters? <laughs> well, let me say some, something real quick about the omnivore piece. You're right. Humans are omnivores. But what we have to understand is we are not omnivores by design. We're omnivores by technology. We only reason that we can include and extract high quality nutrition in a safe and efficient way from both plants and animals is because we've created the technologies that have allowed us to, to do it. And what's fascinating is if you look at our uh, ancestral past and the, and the technologies that we created to help us include animals in our diet and also the, the technologies that we've created to uh, include plants in our diet, um, there's a very big difference. Up until the agriculture revolution, which is when everything changes. So up until that, um, 
almost every technology surrounding, including animals in our diet, had something to do with with um, allowing us to overcome our physical limitations and get the animal, right? Getting it, right? So it's like bows and spears and atlatls and boomerangs and throwing sticks and fishing nets and fishing hooks and traps and deadfalls to, to get the animal. Once you have that animal, all you need is a sharp edge and you have a, a, a pile of incredibly nutrient-dense bioavailable food right there. You don't even have to cook it. Although with meat, and I'll say that in a minute, um, there's a little bit of an advantage to cooking meat, slight, but there is. But you don't need it, right? You can get amazing. Plants is something completely different. Again, before the agriculture revolution, when the agriculture revolution hits, there's a ton of technological developments going into plows and all the other things, but and harvesting equipment, planting, all that. But up until then, getting the plants is really easy. You might need a digging stick to get some roots and maybe a sharp edge to cut something off. But for the most part, you're, you're collective foraging and you're gathering it. The technological needs, you know, what we need to create to allow us to overcome our physical limitations with plants is uh, technologies that allow us to detoxify the plants and make the nutrients in the plants available to our incredibly inefficient digestive tract. So for animals, it's about getting the animals. For plants, it's about making them safe and uh, increasing the bioavailability. As far as the carnivore piece is concerned, uh, there's a great uh, primatologist from Harvard by the name of Richard Rangham, who's done a lot of work in this area in the role of fire. And one thing that he's found is it is difficult for the human body to, in a very efficient manner, eat a hunk of, you know, di fully digest a hunk of raw red meat. We can do it, but it works really hard to do it. So there's a little bit of an advantage to physically breaking down that meat. And, and we see this, like, um, if you go to a really nice restaurant and order raw red meat, you get it one of two ways, either carpaccio where it's sliced super thin, it's mechanically been broken down for you, or tartare where it's been, you know, ground up or chopped up. Again, it's been mechanically broken down for you. And there's a little bit of an advantage to cooking, not overcooking, which goes the other direction, but a little bit of cooking. So if you're looking at the most bioavailable way to eat red meat, It'd be if there was a combination of a little bit of, of, of physical breakdown through chopping or slicing or dicing and a little bit of cooking. So probably, the, you know, the, the most bioavailable way to eat red, red meat would be like a, a medium or a hamburger. And you get a little bit, little bit of both. But regardless, we're talking about um, in the minutia with the, the nutrient density of, of something like meat compared to, say, a plant. The problem is, and this is where I think we need to reframe some of the, the carnivore approach is that we inch, we know archaeologically, we're very confident that we've introduced meat into our diet at uh, almost three and a half million years ago. Through And, and we were doing that by uh, creating tools that allowed us to scavenge off of carcasses on the African savanna. So we introduced meat then. Not much changes. Like there's not much biological change that corresponds with the introduction of meat in the diet. And there's several fat things that could be uh, at play here, but regardless... We introduced meat into the diet at about three and a half million years ago. And for the next million and a half years, there's a little bit of body growth, a little bit of brain growth, but that's it. What's fascinating is that two million years ago, we see the most significant jump in body and brain size. And what happens at two million years ago are, I'm convinced, and many, many other archaeologists, that there's two technological developments. One is fire, which is important. But more, to, in my mind, even more, uh, more significant is the uh, development of hunting technologies. We hunt, we begin hunting at 2 million years ago. And because of that, we're apex predators. We can take animals down at will. And most importantly, because we've taken that animal down, not some other predator, we have first access to the most nutrient dense bioavailable parts of that animal. And it's not the meat. It is the blood, the fat, and the organs. So because we have this huge influx of nutrition that is not only so dense, but incredibly bioavailable, that we're supporting that massive body and brain growth. So it's the, the, the thing about the carnivore approach, the yeah, meat's amazing, but blood, fat, and organs are even more amazing. And I think from uh, not only a nutritional perspective, but uh, from in, in a world, especially right now, where anybody eating animals are subject to a criticism for uh, ethics and sustainability, you know, eating the majority of that animal really helps uh, tick those boxes as well. Yeah. Oh gosh, there's so much there, Bill. So I I recall there's a period of time where we we lived by the sea and we 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 subsided off of mollusks mollusks, 
And, you know, we, we, we managed. And then, as you say, you know, we had uh, access two million years ago to now, all the, you know, the first source of these nutrient dense foods. And I was just going to bring up the issue about, you know, the, the organ meats. And so, you know, we have this argument, oh, you don't need it. And, you know, I personally love liver. I grew up on liver, but you just made an argument that the, the organ meats and the blood are all important aspects of nutrition. It is. And what's, what's uh, incredibly important, what's problematic is, you know, as you know, there's so much of the dietary world right now that is, you know, it, it's polarized. It's either all this or all this. And the reality, the reality of, um, I think a true good message is somewhere in the middle, as well as the practicality of making, you know, whatever your dietary approach is relevant in, in, in the modern world. I mean, we have to do that as well. But one of the far sides of the argument right now, as, as we're all very well aware, is that there are some people suggesting we should eat massive quantities of liver and bull testicles, you know, all the time. And it's that, that's as insane as eating no organs. And I get the question all the time, like, okay, how much liver should I really eat? And the, the crazy thing is, is that that's a question that nobody's ever had to ask before, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a problem that we've created. We are so disconnected from our food that we can go into Whole Foods with a lot of money and buy 10 pounds of chicken liver and come home with 10 pounds of chicken liver, no other part of a chicken, and ask the question, how much of this should I be eating to be healthy? If you ask somebody that question 10,000 years ago, so how much liver should I eat? They'd look down at the animal they just killed and said, well, that much. And then that much spleen and that much kidney and that much heart, that much meat. And then I go kill another animal. And it's really interesting that we have to ask, and we're asking these questions all across the, you know, our, our, our dietary landscape. And I'm convinced that if we reconnect with our food, you know, just take a few links out of our food chain, um, we can begin to answer a lot of these questions for ourselves. And we don't need anybody else's help for some of these more basic questions. But I do think that... Uh, heart, liver, kidney, spleen, high quality fat, marrow, all of these things were not only game changers for our ancestors, but certainly need to be a part of our diet today as well. Yeah. Well, we'll finish up in a couple minutes. I mean, this is why we have you as our, uh, you know, our keynote and uh, addressing where is new nutrition headed, because we want to find some, some middle ground. Uh, I just want to touch on, you know, our tech and our ability to eat plants and specifically grains. And so, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the tech has enabled us to, to eat grains. And, and the question is, is, is that tech that uh, enabled to, to, to do that? Is it, has it been a, a healthier tech for us or, or not a healthy tech? <laughs> it, 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 that's a great question. It's a healthier tech than not including those technologies and still trying to eat the grains, but we know grains entered our diet uh, it depends on where you are in the world and what grains we're talking about, but annual grasses became very important all over the world. Um, you know, rice in some areas, wheat and barley in some areas, maize in other areas um, at a very similar time. And what we see, if we look at the ancestral approaches to those grains, is that a massive amount of technology was going in to what happened to those grains after they were harvested, right? Things like soaking and sprouting and fermenting. And I mean, a re I don't mean a yeast fermentation. I mean, the kind of fermentation, the bacterial fermentation that is a part of a true sourdough process to help detoxify those grains and pre-digest those grains to make them as healthy as possible for, for our human body, preparing those grains for our bodies. Um, the introduction of grains, is was that a healthy development? No, not in my mind. Um, in fact, in, in, in many anthropologists' minds, it wasn't. However, um, if we look at it through a different lens and say, hey, if you're, you know, should we be eating grains? That's one question. And then the other question is, if you're going to eat grains, what is the healthiest way to include them in your diet? Those are two separate questions. I would never tell anybody they need to start including bread in their diet to be healthy. I would, I would never say that. On the other hand, there are a lot of people that are eating bread um, for uh, a whole, whole lot of different reasons. And for those people who are including something like bread in their diets, we have to have a really you know, long conversation about how something like um, a, a wild, long fermented loaf of sourdough bread is a completely different food than a loaf of Wonder Bread from the grocery store. And that's a great example of what I was mentioning earlier. It's not just the what, 
we also have to include the how as far as when humans are concerned in that conversation. There's granivorous birds like ducks and geese that are biologically designed to safely and efficiently consume raw grains and derive high quality nutrition from them. We don't have crops. We don't have gizzards. We don't have those parts of our digestive tract that allow that to happen. But what we can do is replicate the, the chemical and physical processes that happen inside of those organs outside of our bodies before we, we, we consume those grains and make them at least healthier and a little bit more nutritious than they would have been in their, in their raw or even in their cooked state. Yeah, so the tech and the processing of the grains today are are a lot different than say you know ten thousand years ago when when agriculture came. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, and you know, Bill, it's 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 interesting as a physician. Uh, I you know I love Indiana Jones films, and I, I've always loved archaeology. But I think it really applies to understanding, you know, what it is to eat like a human. And, and so even before we've met, I've, I've, I've been fascinated. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this to you. I, I had put a post up on my, my uh, website. Uh, this was years ago when the Horus study came out. And this was a study looking at uh, supposedly ancient mummies. And mm -hmm. the idea is that are there really ancient mummies? Because, you know, mummies really come from South America and, you know, the Egyptian civilizations. And, you know, that's really within the 10,000 year period of time when agriculture uh, really, really took off. And so um, I put this post up about the horse study, which, by the way, was also criticized by the Lancet. After they they were actually reviewed it and they said, well, wait a minute, I think there's a lot of holes in this. And I saw the mm -hmm. holes as well. And uh, the argument is that uh, they, they studied the, the, the Aleutian population, you know, up, up in Alaska. And uh, they, this, this was actually, a, a, you know, supposedly a, uh, not a, not a, they were a, a group that never really um, modernized. That was the mm -hmm. argument that they never really modernized, but they 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 had a process of uh, taking uh, the, the 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 deceased people and putting them into uh, caves, and and they and and because of the cold, they they basically you know they became mummies, and and so um, they they looked at these particular mummies and said, well, they they ne never were really uh, uh, exposed to modern modernization. And they, they, they started to look at all these mummies from around the world, and they, they did um, uh, imaging, uh, CAT scans, looking for atherosclerosis and plaque. And lo and behold, they found, you know, atherosclerosis and plaque in modern mummies. And then they took the, the Aleutian mummies and they said, well, they weren't modernized. They, they, were, they were modern, you know, or they were hunter and gatherers, and, and yet they did have uh, plaque. And, and, and the flaw in the study is that um, well, not in the study, but the, the flaw in the thinking is that the, the illusions were really exposed to uh, tradespeople from all around the world who brought bread and sugar mm. to to them. As well, they lived in these little huts, and the only way to get out of the huts was, uh, you know, because it was a cold environment, is they went up through the smokestacks, and they were exposed to all the smoke, mm. and so. You know, basically, the argument is that uh, they really were exposed to a lot of modern foods from from people traveling to that part of the world um, from Europe, and they were exposed to the smoke. And so we put this post up, and then uh, a couple months later, I get this uh, this book in the mail, and huh. I don't, yeah, and so. Uh, this is titled To the Aleutians and Beyond, the Anthropology of William S. Laughlin. And the, the, the primary editor was Bruno Froelich. And he sent me, he mailed this to me, Bruno Froelich um, mailed this to me. And he, he basically was one of the, the, the writers of the book. And he was, he was retired at the time. And um, I think he was at National... Uh, National Museum in Washington. And uh, I tried to contact him because I don't know if he was mad at me or happy with me. <laughs> I suspect he was mad, but I, I tried to reach out to him and uh, to tell him that, you know, I really appreciated the book and I, I don't know how he found my post, but, but he did. Hmm. And, you know, the, the argument there is that, and I agree with you that uh, perhaps 
um, our tech to uh, afford the ability to, to eat grains uh, long term might not be the best thing for us. And you know, today certainly, uh, if you're going to consume grains, they have to be uh, teched or produced in, in in a way that's similar to uh, the past. Absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent. You know, we actually own part of our our restaurant is a sourdough bakery and it's crazy i'm sitting here i was telling the guys downstairs and getting ready for this i i had just done something i got a ton of flour dumped on me when i was doing it. i said i'm about to go speak on a podcast about low carb denver and i'm gonna be covered in flour what are you doing but the reality is what, what we're trying to do here is you know we don't our family does not eat a lot of bread when we do it's always 100 percent wild long fermented sourdough but um we eat very little of it we are tr we are un we understand that our community and our customers and the people coming here are at completely different places in their own health journey and even you know they might have a particular take on something they have an entire family next to them that might be doing something different and what we're trying to do is 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 uh, utilize these ancestral technologies to make whatever food it is as safe and nourishing as it can be and that also goes for bread and and I, we can have a much longer conversation about this at another time but again i think it's very important there's there's something about what is the ideal human diet and i think we should you know have large amazing conversations about that that diet uh, what that diet is cannot be separated from that how conversation because the foods themselves mean one thing, the foods prepared properly mean something completely different. And on the other hand, there are a whole lot of foods that might not be a part of the ideal human diet, but can be incredibly enhanced in safety, nutrient density, and bioavailability through uh, different types of, of technological innovations. Yeah. Well, look, I know you produce sourdough bread uh, for customers. And, and so, you, you know, uh, some individuals can tolerate it and, and, and some can't, particularly if you're diabetic, eating any kind of product from grain is, is, is difficult. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, I like that you offer a variety of foods to your customers that come in. And, and at the same time, I, I think that uh, you probably educate your customers. <laughs> we, we, that's, a, that's our main priority is, is, is the educational piece. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, great, Bill. I, I think, well, that's all I, I have today. And uh, I always like to ask, uh, you know, first of all, we're really looking forward to having you come to our conference uh, for the first time. And Mark Kukazella was the one that uh, recommended. But what do you really enjoy about uh, coming to these events in person? You know, the, the most important part of a conference, I think there's so many wonderful things about conferences. You, you get so much information and so much inspiration. And, and but the value, I think, of a lot of these conferences is what happens in between the different presentations, what happens at the meals, what happens in the hallways, what happens in the vendor halls. I mean, those those interactions, and in some cases for me, lifelong friendships have been developed and, 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 and colleagues. What happens at the conferences in person can nowhere, uh, can, cannot be replicated in any other way. So I am super excited to come. Um, I haven't been to your conference before. I'm so excited to be there. I'm so honored to be to be the keynote speaker there. Um, and I've heard nothing but amazing things from the from the previous years. So I'm really looking forward to it. Great. Well, well, how can our audience find out more about you? So on social media, we have uh, two uh, distinct platforms. One is a uh, at Dr. Bill Schindler, at Dr. Bill Schindler, and that's where anything that has to do with education or research can, can really be found. Um, and then at Modern Stone Age Kitchen, which is where you can find out information about, or keep in, uh, up to date with the information about the restaurant. And then online, uh, eatlikeahuman.com is, uh, again, the education research piece. And then at, or sorry, uh, modernstoneagekitchen.com is where you can find out more information about the restaurant. Great. And if you want to hear from more from Bill and our other speakers, uh, please consider supporting Nutritionist Science and science attending our uh, event. And to find out more information about our event, please visit lowcarbconferences.com. So that's all for now. And uh, we look forward to uh, meeting you in person in February, Bill. I look forward to it too. See you soon.